Hi, I'm Jim Gordon with another edition of Small Cap Interviews. In the spotlight today, Goliath Resources, founder and CEO Roger Rosmus, and Dr. Quentin Henney from Prescat Capital. They join us next. Roger and Quentin are joining us now here at the table. I uh, should mention uh, Quentin, the technical and geological director for uh, Crestcat Capital, who are a strategic shareholder with Goliath. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Thanks for Thanks having us. You. You're quite welcome. Uh, Roger, it has literally been a year since we last spoke. Yes, uh, yes. It has been a great year since we last spoke. Uh, update our viewers sure. on what's been going on the last year. Yeah, well, we you know, went out to drill 15,000 meters, ended up uh, expanding the program substantially, drilled over 38,000 meters. Uh, we were hitting visible gold in pretty much every hole we were drilling, so we thought, hey, we, we really need to expand on, on the program. As you know, we've got a short window to make that happen, mm -hmm. so we were able to ramp up to eight rigs and uh, got the job done. And uh, as far as the results, uh, visually, 92% of the holes actually had visible gold or abundant visible gold. Uh, it's a very coarse grain type of material, uh, which is uh, pretty exciting to see in the core. Uh, we have uh, announced a number of the holes uh, to date, and it was a bit of a backlog at the, at the labs, but they're slowly finally getting through the, the, the bottleneck. Uh, we announced a remarkable hole mm -hmm. on January the 13th, uh, where we drilled uh, uh, 39 meters of over an ounce, like 34 grams per ton gold equivalent. And then within that, we have about 10 meters of over four ounces of material. So that is one of these holes that are kind of up in the upper percentile on a global basis, probably for the last decade. Wow. Just following up on what Roger said, the Sherbet is, is very comparable to Pogo. Could you expand a little bit of that and give us your thoughts? Yeah, certainly. Look, uh, you know, people have to understand what Pogo is, first of all. So uh, Pogo is a gold deposit in Alaska. It's not far from Fairbanks. It's east of Fairbanks. And it's been in production for, I think, around 30 years at this point. It was found in the early late 1980s or early 1990s, I believe. Um, it was a grassroots discovery. Mm -hmm. It was actually a joint venture between Sumitomo Metal Mining and Tech. And they found, uh, they were looking for base metals, found a gold deposit. And it turned out to be a big gold deposit. About 10, 10 million ounces produced to date. Right. Lots of resource. But it's basically a, a vein system that's relatively flat. So flat, we'll call it sheeted veins, if, if people like that term or not, you know, it's up for debate. But basically flattish veins that collectively comprise uh, a a deposit, a load deposit that's been a very prolific mine. It's produced two or three hundred thousand ounces a year for many, many years now. And you have some samples over there. We will, of course, if you're focusing on the desserts we have on the table, we don't often do that. We'll explain why in a few minutes. But uh, let's talk about some of the samples you have over there. Yeah, look, uh, you know, if you kind of do this chronologic order, this uh, this slab comes from a piece of float that was collected in the early days of prospecting at Sherbet. And most of what you see here, the shiny material is sulfide. So these are sulfide minerals that probably come out of a core part of one of the veins at Sherbet, extremely high grade. Uh, so this piece of material tumbled down the slope. They found it in the bottom of a pile of talus rubble. Uh, happened to assay it, comes back about, tw what is it, 29 ounces of gold and, and nearly 100 ounces of silver per ton. Just an extremely high grade sample, uh, but it shows you the kind of grades and potential that uh, are present at Sherbet. Now that that's outcrop, or that was float. Okay, since that time, a lot of drilling has been conducted. Uh, probably the next sample, I guess I would talk about. Uh, I'll talk about the high grade. So this this is a piece of the core that was released uh, from hole 260. It was released about a week ago extremely uh, coarse visible gold in the core. It's hard to see from the camera, I'm sure, but there's a lot of small particles of coarse visible gold throughout this core. Uh, when, as a geologist, I see that, I, you know, this is a system that was able to produce grain. There's clearly something special about this rock. It's associated with quartz vein, quartz vein system. Uh, like Roger said, I think there was about 10 meters in there where there was nearly four ounces per ton. I mean, that's, that's just hands down incredible discovery. Uh, this is out of the Bonanza Ledge. So it's not out of the Sherbet structure, it's actually out of the, one of the deeper structures. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And then this piece of core here actually comes from uh, an intrusive, so uh, basically a, a magmatic body or intrusive body that's associated with the Sherbet system. They've encountered this in a few holes, this intrusive kind of salt and pepper looking rock. And this seems to have a close association with mineralization at Sherbet. This uh, happens to be a kind of a unique age. It's a relatively young intrusion for the Golden Triangle region. And I think that's part of the really intriguing story here. I think we're starting to see close association of this with the high grade gold. And you can even see in places where quartz veins cut the intrusion, there's particles of visible gold in the intrusion itself, which is very intriguing. And then look, this sample here is an entirely new discovery. Um, it is called Treasure Island. It is about, about 20 or 30 kilometers yeah, 30, north 30, 30 kilometers of Sherbet, sure but it's all, all part of the Gold Digger Project. Okay, so this is at the opposite end of the Gold Digger Project. It is core that came out of the first drill campaign at Treasure Island. And you can see massive calcopyrite here at this end, along with calcopyrite in black shale down here at this end. This, to me, looks like uh, something out of a, likely out of a VMS system, which is really intriguing. This is an exciting discovery in its own right. Uh, and now, of course, to the desserts. Uh, we'll stay with you for a second. Uh, the baklava that it, it reminds you of the, the, the geological layers of Goliath. Uh, it, it does, and I, you know, I, I draw on <laughs> analogies to help investors and people understand, you know, some of the the geology of these gold deposits. Baklava happens to be a layered pastry, you know, yeah, like a yeah. paper, but then you have the little layers with the walnuts, right? Right. And the honey, and uh, that's where the good stuff is. Well, at at Sherbet. What, what they're finding is that the veins, like I said, are like poke. They're flat, dipping things, and there's a stack of them. Okay, so it's like the walnuts here. Mm -hmm. It's basically a stack vein system. That's, that's my analogy. And I, I've never had a chance to actually eat the samples that people have brought, but we will do that off camera. <laughs> uh, again, since we last talked, Roger, back yeah. to you. Uh, talk about some of the notable shareholders sure. uh, that have jumped on board recently. Yeah, well, obviously, Crescat's been one of our uh, flagship shareholders even before we drilled, <coughs> pardon me, the Sherbet discovery. Uh, shortly thereafter, Eric Sprott came in. I guess Clinton was speaking with him about ideas and names, and so Eric uh, came into the story. And then uh, just recently, I guess more, I guess uh, last year, 2024, uh, Rob McEwen came in as a shareholder uh, personally, mm -hmm. uh, as well a uh, Larry Childress, who doesn't invest in many things, but when he does, he goes fairly large. He, he's a geologist uh, based out of the States. Then obviously this new group, a global commodity group based out of uh, Singapore, who are now sitting around, I think around 6% uh, ownership of, of the company. So they all have uh, participated uh, in the last round of financings uh, from last year. It was just over $23 million. Um, of note, actually, I kind of shocked myself when I added up the numbers, but I've raised uh, over $62 million in the last three years in a very sh crappy market. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it tells you you know, a testament to we do have a world-class discovery that I do believe will be a tier one high-grade gold deposit at the end of the day and will be a mine one day. As we were talking just off camera here, uh, you know, the initial discovery we had two kilometers of mineralization at surface, a kilometer up the south slope of the mountain, another 1.1 kilometer down the north slope mm -hmm. with uh, 700 meters of vertical relief. Uh, we took channel cuts that were kind of 10 meters, 10 grams kind of type of thing which caught Quinton's eye and Crescat, mm -hmm. and that's really how it was the catalyst, how they got involved initially. Uh, since then, we had a, a maiden drill program, 2021, uh, just over 5,000 meters. We had on every hole we drilled, uh, even though we stepped out about 1.1 kilometer. Fast forward to today, we have just roughly under 100,000 meters drilled into this 1.8 square kilometer area. As far as some context to size, we're talking about, I think it's like the third or half the size of downtown core of uh, Vancouver. And it remains open. Okay. Okay, so we don't know how big this thing is. The, the more we drill the system, the bigger it gets. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of more coarse grain type material, obviously, with uh, the visible gold. We're seeing the Bonanza. It does remain wide open. Uh, typically, um, I'm sure, Quentin, you can agree with me on this, that uh, most of these discoveries, they start out really, really big. And then as you drill them, it gets really, really small. Uh, our case is the inverse. Uh, again, we're finding new zones, new layers. Uh, one thing that uh, I forgot to mention is we have drilled below the valley floor for the first time last year. We for, found four brand new lenses, uh, two of which have visible gold. We had no idea it existed. So clearly, 
there's lots going on down there. So we've got uh, a lot more drilling to do. So as we've been drilling, we've been finding uh, this intrusive type material, which we ignored uh, up until this past year. Uh, it was based by the BCSG. It's kind of like barren rock. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of our uh, geologists noticed uh, something shiny, snapped open the uh, this uh, one of the uh, cores. This we see this quartz veining and found visible gold, a big chunk of molly. So uh, about high bismuth as well. So we ended up relogging. 17 holes from 2021 to 2023, of which uh, more than 50% actually had visible gold, molly, bismuth. So, um, and obviously that's excited Quentin as well, and a lot of geologists, because again, this could be one of the one of the portals that brought up mineralization uh, into the system. They run sort of north-south, you know, our veins are coming uh, sort of north, uh, or sort of east-west type of thing. So, it's super exciting. We could have like the mothership here, the feeder zone is. is Partially part of that, or the big burrito, I think you've coined it as, <laughs> as, in some of your previous videos with Crestcap. But uh, we think that we're, we might be on it. And again, hitting this high grade material, we might be getting closer to the source. So that's really kind of one of our focuses again for, for 2025 is to, if we, can, if we can find that mothership, that would be pretty fantastic. Anything to add, Quinn? Yeah, look, uh, when exploration uh, occurs over a multi year campaign like we're talking about here, uh, Exploration is iterative, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it requires feedback. So the first year you, you learn something. Next year you learn a little bit more, more, and more. And every, every year you go at it, you have to change your plan, you have to change your theory, your, your target, whatever. The, the high grade that they hit at the Bonanza Ledge was really in, which is one of the lower layers, okay? One of the lower vein sets was hit more by happenstance by some drilling that went beyond the shear bed zone. Okay, boom, they hit some high grade. Hmm, that's interesting. Come back at it, let's target that a little more, more you know. Uh, boom, now we have 20 holes that, that hit this thing, and it looks like it might be the, the, the biggest part of this thing, the feeder zone, as you put it. So um, it's very exciting. Uh, you know, pe seeing pieces of the story like this, the intrusive play into that. You know, now you can start to see a picture evolve where, yeah, this could be a, a world class high grade gold system. And Quentin, this is your theory. It's been discussed many times by you. Can you talk about connecting the dots of successful mines being part of a bigger system, I guess, in and around the Triangle area? Sure. Yeah, look, uh, you know, most Canadian geologists will call me a heretic because <laughs> I'm coming up and, and thinking up other ideas. I'll okay. Just but, and I have deep respect for all the work that's been done in the Golden Triangle, and I think it's fantastic. I mean, the, the red line, which is discussed frequently in context of the Golden Triangle, is really a, a kind of this observation amongst a lot of geologists that there's this boundary between two particular rock units. And basically, most of the big ore bodies in the Golden Triangle have been found plus or minus, you know, a few hundred meters, maybe a kilometer, say, right, within right. either side of this red line. And it's not just a straight line, it kind of waves back and forth like this. That's true. That's absolutely true. Okay, that observation holds water. In fact, there's even geologic reasons for why those deposits are where they are. They basically formed in that hiatus of time mm -hmm. where you, you kind of transition from this VMS environment into, a, in, well, porphyry environment as well. Okay, so you kind of see this transition. That's great, but I've noticed that there's another process going on in the Golden Triangle. And I think we see it at Sherbet, for example. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, Goliath has supported a student here recently. He's actually documented this, studied it, and pro proven the association between the intrusive, mm -hmm. which you see here, as well as the veins that uh, occur at Sherbet. That intrusion is very young compared to the red line, okay? That intrusion is way younger. It's what we call Eocene in age. Okay. And while a lot of people would never, ever, ever suspect an Eocene intrusion would be a mineralizing intrusion in the Golden Triangle, I think they're very important. Okay, now I think they're also associated with the, the certain period where there was a lot of, we'll say, compression. Basically, the plates were com colliding and you have a lot of thrusting. Okay, why do we have a, a baklava stacked vein system? Is because it formed during that particular period 
There's also magmas that came up with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can imagine these gold-rich magmas coming up, and then there's these flat structures that are available right. to, to host mineralization. You're going to get something exciting. Right. I think there's a lot of gold systems in the Golden Triangle that need further study because I think you're going to find this Eocene magmatism is associated with the number. And from my view, uh, my theory, I guess, is that it's like piano case. Okay, at one time when this was all forming, it was all one very discrete zone or process. Since that time, it's been broken up and in, in compartmentalized into pieces. But we can see discrete areas where you have this style of, of mineralization. You know, there, I could ramble off the companies that have this style. I mean, even near us, uh, there's uh, Dolly Varden, which has Homestake mm -hmm. Ridge. Yeah. It looks like it's part of what, a, a piano key, if you will. Right. It's a broken yeah. piece of this. And then you go up to Stewart, you've got even uh, the old Premier Mine. You've got uh, Scotty. you got, uh, you know, you go north from there, you got maybe even Bruce Jack. You know, uh, there's, there's definitely more going on in the Golden Triangle than just the old red line, we'll call it, traditional model. Roger, you want to add on to that? Uh, just yeah, on the red line uh, theory, um, just uh, some folks might not know, but we actually control 56 kilometers up the red line. Mm -hmm. Our land package is huge. We've got yeah. over 91,000 hectares. Um, and all, all the stuff further to the north is that but that Canberra ice field where, again, we've drilled Treasure Island, which is a brand new discovery. Never been drilled before, never been sampled before. Ever a sample we took in 2023 ran, ran at least one gram per ton gold equivalent or 1% copper. So we're really uh, looking forward to seeing what these assays are going to turn out. Can you imagine if we have another SK Creek that's even bigger than Sherbet? Like that would be a really nice upside surprise. Uh, Quentin, you mentioned earlier with a sample from Treasure Island there. Uh, can you talk uh, a bit more about that? You know, texturally, this, this is distinct from most of the stuff you see at Sherbet. It's, mm -hmm. At Sherbet, you see quartz veins with a bit of sulfide, and they're very discrete, uh, well-defined vein sets, okay? Here, VMS, this is probably associated with some of the older rocks in right. this region. So yeah. basically, it formed on the sea floor. Um, the formation of this vastly different than, than the veins we see at your bed. But uh, when rocks like this, that you know, VMS formed on the seafloor are brought up, basically abducted and stuck onto the, to the continent where we can get to them, uh, they go through a lot of deformation, you know, so they, they tend to get folded in, in a bit like tooth, toothpaste, you know. And you can kind of see that a little bit in, in these rocks. Some of this is uh, stock work, but it's tightly folded. It's probably been deformed as it was uh, abducted under the, the continent. Classic texture zone. Calcopyrite, very pure calcopyrite bands. To me, this looks like probably a Kuroko type VMS system. It's beautiful stuff. Uh, Roger, we'll give you the, uh, the last word. Uh, let's talk about, I'm hoping we do talk before this time next year, uh, sure. but let's talk about the rest of 2025 for you and Goliath. Sure. Uh, good question. Uh, you know, we're still waiting for assays to come back, so we're going to have a, a pretty major overhaul to the model that we currently have, so the, the next iteration. Uh, but ultimately, uh, once we have that, we'll be able to kind of lay out a drill program for 2025. Uh, we've got lots of cash in the Treasury right now, uh, around $7 million, plus we've got $9.5 million of warrants that are in, in the money, all expiring in 2025, sort of Q1 a third, Q2 a third, and then uh, Q4 a third. So that money will be coming in, uh, and it has been slowly trickling in as we speak. Uh, so that'll get us the ability to get a, the program off to a great start. Uh, we're hoping to get in there end of May, early June, hopefully drilling, uh, you know, first week of June, second week of June at the latest. Uh, you guys do have a very active uh, website. Where can people find out more information? Sure. Uh, Goliath Resources, uh, ltd.com. Excellent. Uh, great to see you again. Thank you. Nice to meet you. It's uh, Roger Masmus. It's uh, Dr. Quentin Henney, and they're part of Goliath Resources. Thank you both. Thank you.